We are very excited to welcome Dr. Eva Rawlings Parker to Global Derm Talks. Uh, so Dr. Rawlings Parker is an assistant professor of dermatology and she's core faculty in the Center for Med Biomedical Ethics and Society at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. Her academic expertise includes the health effects of climate change, global health, HIV dermatoses, tropical skin disease, and infectious disease dermatology. She serves as faculty lead for DEI in dermatology at Vanderbilt University Medical Center and is passionate about ensuring access to quality dermatological care for underserved populations. Dr. Parker staffs Nashville General Hospital's Dermatology Clinic and Vanderbilt's HIV Clinic, while also providing volunteer dermatologic care to immigrant, refugee, and underserved populations in Nashville, Tennessee at Siloam Health and Shade Tree Clinic. Additionally, she is a member of Addis Clinic's Volunteer Medical Corps, providing telehealth consultation services in Africa, and is an external supervisor and mentor at the Regional Dermatology Training Center in Moshi, Tanzania. She has a BS in Environmental Science and is the co-chair of the American Academy of Dermatology's Expert Resource Group on Climate Change and Environmental Issues, the Associate Editor of the Journal of Climate Change and Change in Environmental Health Issues, oh, sorry, um, Journal of Climate Change and Health, and a member of the International Society of Dermato Dermatology's Committee on Climate Change. Additionally, she is a member of the AAD's World Congress Fund Review Task Force and an external advisor for the International League of Dermatological Society's uh, WHO Official Relations Committee. Dr. Parker actively publishes and speaks at national and international meetings on the dermatologic effects of climate change and the intersection of climate change and global health, advocating for climate justice and healthcare sustainability and promoting broader education on the health impacts caused by climate change. So we're very welcome to, uh, very excited to welcome um, Dr. Rawlings Parker on uh, Earth Day. So go take it away, Dr. Parker. Well, thank you so much for that warm welcome and for inviting me to speak on the day earmarked to celebrate Mother Nature and our beautiful planet. Um, I, I'm truly honored to be here to discuss this critically important topic. I will give a brief overview of climate science and its impacts on health with a more in-depth examination of the effects on dermatologic disease, health systems, and vulnerable populations today. And then we'll wrap up with some ways that you all can engage on these issues. And this is a very broad topic and I hope to cover a lot of ground. So let's jump in. And so to frame this conversation, we have to understand the problem and the scope of that problem first. We've come a long way from thousands of years ago to the start of the Industrial Revolution in the 1880s to today. But in doing so, human consumption of goods and resources over the last century has skyrocketed. And that's come at a price, especially because the dramatic increase in combustion of fossil fuels globally has been observed since the 1950s. And burning fossil fuels is now the largest threat to planetary and human health. As a consequence of burning fossil fuels, the concentration of heat trapping greenhouse gases has dramatically increased. And in this chart mapping the last 800,000 years, we see an exponential increase in CO2 over the last 100 years alone. And as CO2 levels have risen, so has the temperature such that we are about 1.15 degrees Celsius warmer than the 1880s. And we've experienced the hottest years ever on record in the last decade with 2023 being the hottest year to date. And we're on track to beat that already for 2024. Consequently, heat has become foundational to the wide range of climate impacts currently being observed. This is especially true in the Arctic, where temperatures are increasing two to three times faster than elsewhere on the planet. Bright white ice reflects uh, 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 sun and heat, but as polar ice uh, absorbs that heat, it melts, and the loss of libido increases heat absorption and permafrost thaws, methane is released, and both of these end up amplifying the global warming effect. Melting polar ice also expands the volume of the oceans, accelerating sea level rise, and global warming is impacting our ocean's role in stabilizing climate, shifting major weather patterns such as the jet stream. 
the oceans absorb 90% of the heat trapped by greenhouse gases. The implication is that warm ocean water has greater rates of evaporation, increasing the frequency and intensity of severe storms. However, due to extreme heat, ex historically arid areas have experienced crushing droughts and many more wildfires. The result is the growing threat of extreme weather events globally. And we have seen wildfires ravage every continent um, except Antarctica. We've seen deadly heat waves in Europe and the US. We've seen hurricanes slam into the Caribbean and the US and unprecedented flooding in places like Pakistan. And while we think about the global effects of, of these weather events, we know that importantly, low and middle income countries will be disproportionately impacted from these events. Human activity is also affecting UV and air pollution. Chlorofluorocarbons, which were previously used as refrigerants in, and in manufacturing are a triple environmental threat because they are long lived. They act as potent greenhouse gases and destroy the stratospheric ozone layer, increasing UVB radiation, reaching Earth's surface. And due to complex feedback mechanisms, ozone depletion is actually worsening climate change in the Southern Hemisphere and vice versa. Anthropogenic climate change and air pollution have the same root cause, which is burning fossil fuels. Additionally, the contribution to air pollution from natural sources such as dust and wildfires is amplified by heat and drought resulting from climate change. Both heat and UV, which have increased due to human activity, catalyze the formation of secondary pollutants like ground level ozone. And it's important to note that the vast majority of the world is already breathing unhealthy levels of air pollution, which causes more than 8 million premature deaths annually. By 2050, there will be more plastic in the ocean than fish. And biodiversity is being lost and ecosystems are on the verge of collapsing due to deforestation, coral bleaching and eminent ecological tipping points. And while the specific climate impacts observed do vary by geography, the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change states that, quote, no inhabited region on Earth will escape the dire impacts. So regardless of location, every nation and every community is affected by heat, pollution, and extreme weather events. Importantly, however, vulnerable and marginalized patients within our own communities in the U.S., as I mentioned a minute ago, low and middle income countries globally are and will continue to experience disproportionate impacts from climate events. And while these problems are very complex, the basic progression of their relationship is not. Human action has significantly increased greenhouse gas emissions, which has warmed the planet and thus changed our climate. And we know the science is clear on this relationship. But what are the downstream impacts? First and foremost is harm to public health, creating a global health crisis, which includes exacerbation of health disparities. Additionally, there are enormous economic repercussions, national security considerations, failure of infrastructure, food insecurity, mass migration, poverty, and armed conflicts and intergenerational inequities such that future generations will be disproportionately affected. And I will contextualize many of these as we move along this morning. In particular, there is a funnel effect on the health impacts that result from the pressures applied by climate change, such that our overconsumption results in ecological harm, which drives and creates hazards that are the proximate causes that harm human health. Geopolitics, poverty, institutional racism, and conflict can further amplify these effects. Consequently, health is being affected now. The interactions are complex and multifactorial, and the economic burden is estimated to be at least $1 trillion annually in the U.S. alone. So climate change acts as a threat multiplier for health, equity, and health systems. This diagram illustrates the complex web of factors that ultimately contribute to the health effects resulting from climate change. 
basically every organ system is impacted as you can see from the long list here, including skin disease, of which there are many cutaneous processes that are climate sensitive. The influence of climate change on skin disease is often multifactorial because skin is the largest organ and is our primary interface with the environment. It also uniquely displays cutaneous manifestations of systemic disease, which are duly impacted by climate change. Heat is foundational to the wide range of climate and health impacts currently being observed. The number, intensity, and duration of heat waves are increasing. The result is that we have shifted to more hot weather. Don't forget that the skin plays a critical role in thermoregulation, dissipating heat via the production of sweat and through vasodilation, wherein as much as 60% of cardiac output may be shunted to cutaneous vessels during heat stress. I want to highlight the concept of wet bulb temperature, which looks at heat, humidity, and evaporative cooling. The more humid the air, the less our sweat evaporates, reducing our body's ability to cool. As a result, the combination of heat and humidity is much more dangerous than heat alone, such that we lose our ability to effectively cool via evaporation beyond a wet bulb temperature of 95 degrees Fahrenheit. And this concept is key because not only are the number of heat wave days increasing, but the number of high humidity days are also increasing nationally and globally, pushing us closer to that maximal threshold for evaporation. Heat, humidity, and prolonged perspiration play a role in numerous heat-induced and heat-exacerbated diseases, including miliaria, Grover's disease, folliculitis, hydradenitis suppurativa, and Haley-Haley disease. Heat also increases cutaneous carcinogenesis. And those for those with hypohydrosis or anhydrosis um, or with extensive skin disease and compromise of sweating, or patients who are on many commonly prescribed dermatologic medications such as antihistamines, anticholinergics, or spironolactone, their ability to thermoregulate is further compromised and heat stroke is a greater risk for those patients. Additionally, heat also increases the risk of common cutaneous infections, promoting both pathogenesis of bacterial infections, such as staph, as well as antibiotic resistance within those bacteria. Common yeast and dermatophyte infections also increase during warm, humid weather, and many species of fungus demonstrate thermotolerance, permitting survival under heat stress. Warming has increased the range and survival of insects, exacerbating vector-borne diseases, Additionally, heat influences human behavior, resulting in the donning of fewer clothes with more exposed skin. And warmer temperatures prompt increased time spent outdoors, therefore increasing environmental exposure to air pollution, UV, and insects. Because of global warming, we are seeing a significant shift in the frost cycle, with the first frost of the fall occurring later and the last frost in the spring occurring sooner, effectively reducing the span of colder weather during winter months. Consequently, warming has increased the range and survival of insects, which exacerbates vector-borne diseases. Local factors determine the endemic range of many diseases, and these factors are impacted by climate variables through alteration in and, and complex interplay between microbes, their vectors, animal reservoirs, human behavior, and migration of both humans and animals. For example, ticks live two to three years and have a life cycle consisting of three stages. At each stage, the tick must have a blood meal to progress to the next cycle. However, ticks are only active when temperatures are above freezing. As a result of global warming, ticks now have longer active seasons, greater survival odds to adulthood, and an increased chance of reproduction because winters may no longer be cold enough to kill nymphs, allowing survival to another season. In particular, we are observing acceleration of the tick life cycle with greater numbers of ticks completing full life, life cycles in a single calendar year rather than over two to three years. Higher temperatures are also a key factor affecting northward spread of tick habitats. 
Such expansion and range is predicted to continue in the coming decades in both North America and in Europe. Exodes, amblyoma, and derma center ticks are capable of transmitting numerous diseases, and these are found both in commonly in the United States as well as in Europe and other parts of the world. Climate-induced range expansion and longer tick biting seasons means greater potential for transmission of tick-borne illnesses. This is especially true of Lyme disease, which is the most common vector-borne disease in temperate climates, and the incidence has notably increased in the U.S., and in Canada, um, where it's now routinely being transmitted north of the border. Not surprisingly, the increased incidence of Lyme closely maps with the range expansion of Ixodes. Insect vectors, including mosquitoes, sandflies, and reduvid bugs are also capable of transmitting numerous diseases to humans. An establishment of invasive mosquito species are increasingly reported in Europe and North America, and it is in part driven by importation through global trade into new geographical ranges with increasingly favorable climates for survival, which is thanks to global warming. Specifically, mosquitoes thrive in warm weather with higher relative humidity. So like ticks, warmer temperatures have expanded the range of mosquitoes and lead to longer active mosquito seasons. Warmer temperatures also enhance reproduction and accelerate the mosquito life cycle, increasing the number of mosquitoes per season. But it's not just insects that benefit from increased temperatures because we also see increased replication rates of viral and parasitic pathogens within the mosquito, leading to increased infectious load. Warmer temperatures also increase biting rates and they alter our behavior, prompting people to wear less clothing. The result is an increased opportunities, opportunity for mosquitoes to bite exposed skin and transmit disease. They also need water to reproduce. So extreme weather events that cause flooding expand the breeding range for mosquitoes and can provide the ideal conditions for mosquito-borne diseases such as West Nile virus, dengue, chikungunya, Zika, and malaria to become epidemic. Different species of mosquitoes transmit different infections, just like different species of ticks transmit different infections. But you may be thinking someone only gets a mosquito-borne disease when they travel abroad. Well, not anymore. These infections are now in our backyard with local transmission of all of these illnesses documented in the US and the EU. This includes dengue as well as new cases of malaria that were reported in 2023. There's also mounting concern we may see may soon see reemergence of yellow fever in the United States. In particular, the global distribution of dengue has greatly expanded in the last 50 years. It was only found in nine countries in 1970, but it is now endemic in more than 100 nations with frequent large outbreaks observed worldwide. In the last decade, we have seen surges in dengue following heat waves and flooding. Currently, dengue cases are surging in the Americas, according to the Pan American Health Organization, with cases topping 5.2 million as of last week, surpassing the yearly record set in 2023. And what are we, just in April now? So um, the other thing that's concerning is that deaths due to dengue are also increasing. Based on modeling, the risk of dengue in the U.S. is projected to increase over the next 50 years. And in general, Northern nations will become more susceptible to mosquito-borne diseases with 1 billion people expected to be newly exposed to mosquitoes and their diseases by 2100, with increased epidemic potential of malaria and dengue in particular at temperate Northern latitudes. As with the vectors already discussed, increased temperatures also benefit other insect vectors and parasites with local transmission of Chagas and Leishmaniasis now occurring in places like Texas. With respect to climate impacts, flooding also plays an outsized role in climate-related health effects, much like heat does. Water-related disasters and flooding events have dramatically increased globally since the 1950s. 
Additionally, sea level is rising on an average of three to four millimeters per year, which further contributes. During heavy rainfall and flooding, municipal sewage systems become overwhelmed, releasing large volumes of raw sewage. In addition, agricultural runoff contains livestock waste and other chemicals such as pesticides and petroleum byproducts, which may further be released into the, into the floodwater. This means floodwater contains a lot of pathogens and toxic contaminants. Considering how polluted flood water is, it shouldn't be surprising that a wide range of health threats is observed in victims of floods. The region, the type of disaster, and whether it's salt water or fresh water all play a role in these health effects. Dermatitis is the most common diagnosis with cases occurring at higher rates than, than diarrheal or respiratory illnesses after floods. And I want that to just sink in for a minute that Skin disease is the most common disease seen after flooding. Um, it, it affects our skin more than any other organ system. And that's in part from the irritants and chemicals, as well as the prolonged submersion in floodwaters, which leads to compromise of the skin barriers integrity. Additionally, trauma from submerged debris obscured by these murky floodwaters is also common. In turn, both may predispose to serious skin and soft tissue infections with a variety of pathogens. Stagnant water after flooding also represents an ideal environment for zoonotic and vector-borne diseases to flourish. And because residential buildings become inundated by floodwaters, displacement is common with overcrowding and lack of access to water and sanitation and hygiene. Uh, in temporary shelters serving as an important risk factor for transmission of ectoparasites such as scabies, as well as other infections, including respiratory infections. Additionally, mold overgrowth and homes following flooding may then subsequently flare atopic diseases when, pa when patients return to their homes. Hold on, I'm having a little bit of trouble advancing. There we go. Um, immersion flood is a unique flood associated dermatosis and it is triggered by prolonged exposure to wet environments. The presentation, however, depends on water temperature ranging from classic trench foot to the swollen wrinkled plantar surfaces that may be seen with warm water exposure. Immersion foot importantly may be complicated by secondary polymicrobial toe web infections and pitted keratolysis, and if severe long-term sequelae from vascular and nerve injury can result in neuropathy, pain, ulceration, necrosis, and even the need for amputation. Importantly, effects of losing loved ones, homes, and livelihoods lead to numerous long-term psycho-emotional consequences and prolonged grief. With dermatology specifically stress-related exacerbation of atopic dermatitis, seborrheic dermatitis, acne, psoriasis, and alopecia areata have been observed. Additionally, attempts to cope with the stress can lead to the induction of delusions of parasitosis, neurotic excoriations, factitial dermatitis, or trichotillomania. As we discussed during extreme weather events, traumatic wounds, exposure to contaminated floodwaters, and a lack of hygiene increase the risk of bacterial infection. And those with atypical pathogens such as mycobacteria, aromonas, melioidosis, and chromobacterium violatium may occur with freshwater exposures all resulting from inoculation of wounds or via entry through a compromised skin barrier. Additionally, a rise in traumatic inoculation related Vibrio infections has paralleled increasing sea surface temperatures from global warming with an increased incidence of Vibrio necrotizing soft tissue infections now reported following hurricanes in the Southeast US. Global warming also lengthens the season and expands geographical areas for optimal survival and transmission of leptospires. Cases peak during the rainy season classically and dramatically increase after flooding and hurricanes when the risk of traumatic inoculation or exposure to mucous membranes is increased. In fact, there have been a number of cases and deaths due to leptospirosis reported in Puerto Rico in recent years associated with various hurricanes. 
Temperature, moisture, and wind patterns uniquely affect fungal growth, distribution, and dispersal. Warmer average global temperatures allow expansion of the geographic range of fung funguses, typically restricted to tropical and subtropical environments, and allow those species to expand into temperate zones. Also, the link between natural disasters and subsequent fungal infections has been increasingly recognized due to soil disruption. Chromoblastomycosis is an implantation mycosis caused by traumatic inoculation of pigmented fungus found within decaying plant matter. And while this infection is classified as a neglected tropical disease of the skin, it is also associated with extreme weather events. Cases have been reported globally, especially in the Southeast, especially in Southeast Asia following tsunamis, but even in the US after hurricanes. Similarly, cases of blastomycosis are reported after extreme weather events in the US. Highly fatal necrotizing mucormycosis resulting from penetrating trauma has been reported as well after tsunamis in Southeast Asia and following tornadoes in the United States. And coccidioidomycosis is probably the most climate sensitive fungal infection. An increased incidence is being observed as an effect of climate change. It's partly because C. impetus outcompetes other for fungal organisms during severe droughts and then thrives in wet periods. More cases are diagnosed when there is a period of extended drought followed by heavy rainfall. And this is a pattern that's more commonly observed now due to climate extremes and seems to be a repeating pattern in the Western United States. Additionally, expansion in range due to global warming is evidenced by new endemic cases occurring in Washington State and Oregon in patients with no travel history. So now let's shift gears a bit and discuss air pollution and its effect on skin health. Pollution generated by the burning of fossil fuels includes particulate matter, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, and gases such as ozone, nitrogen dioxide, and sulfur dioxide. Particulate matter is the major component of both anthropogenic air pollution and wildfire smoke, and it's classified based on size. And I think this diagram is nice because it provides some perspective of how small the particles are. Particulate matter is also quite sticky and is often coated in polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons and heavy metals. Particulate matter is pretty nasty stuff. It penetrates deeply into the lungs and enters the systemic circulation via endothelial tight junctions. It promotes thrombosis and atherosclerosis and crosses the blood-brain barrier. And with its lipophilic properties, the ability to penetrate the epidermis um, directly is a characteristic of air pollution. And it can also pass transdermally by way of follicular and ecrine structures and enter the skin by indirect dermal uptake from the systemic circulation. So as a result, pollution's coming at us from multiple different avenues and it exerts a lot of deleterious effects in the skin. The pathogenic mechanisms of air pollution are incredibly complex as you can appreciate from this diagram. Air pollution produces free radicals and reactive oxygen species and binds and activates the aural hydrocarbon and pregnant X receptors in the skin, triggering molecular cascades that result in depletion of antioxidant capacity, lipid peroxidation with the generation of reactive aldehydes and activation of COX-2 and NF-kappa-B, as well as activation of matrix metalloproteinases causing collagen degradation, inflammatory cytokine production, downregulation of filaggrin with associated skin barrier defects, increased transepidermal water loss, and alteration of our skin's microbiome, leading to increased colonization with pathogens. Like I said, pollution is pretty nasty stuff. Consequently, air pollution plays a major role in extrinsic skin aging, contributing to the development of coarse wrinkles and dry lusterless skin. It is also linked with cutaneous carcinogenesis, combining with UV to exert a synergistic effect on pigmentation and carcinogenic pathways. 
Additionally, air pollution contributes to inflammatory dermatoses, including atopic dermatitis, acne, psoriasis, and autoimmune blistering diseases. And exposure to air pollution may also delay wound healing. Wildfires are another important source in addition to burning fossil fuels. The quantity of smoke and air pollution generated by wildfires is so large that it spreads over vast areas and actually can be seen from space and on satellite images. Particulate matter from West Coast and Canadian fires spread more than 5,000 miles and affected air quality in distant locations over the past few summers. So it really is no wonder that this plays a, a prominent role in exacerbating skin disease. And it's something we should all be aware of because of the vast spread of the particulate matter. You may live far away from a fire, but it may still affect air quality and skin health in the region where you live and work. And I want to, again, move on and, and pivot a little now because I think this entire discussion on health effects would not be complete without reviewing those who are most vulnerable to climate change. Climate vulnerability is influenced by many factors, including physiology, agency, geography, sociopolitical and socioeconomic factors, and access to resources and medical care, making climate change a key component of social and environmental determinants of health. Women, children, and the elderly bear a significant portion of the global health burden. Those with comorbidities such as cardiovascular disease, diabetes, obesity, uh, uh, renal disease, pulmonary disease, mental health disease, or disabilities are also more affected. Additionally, vulnerability to climate change and amplification of existing disparities disproportionately affect people of color, indigenous populations, those of lower socioeconomic status, immigrants, sexual and gender minority groups, the unhoused, and those residing in low and middle income countries. Many of these disparities stem from the legacy of structural racism and colonialism, highlighting how environmental impacts, social justice, and health have key intersectionality. Therefore, I wanna to briefly touch on environmental injustice and hopefully, hopefully enhance your understanding of how critical this topic is to the vulnerability of marginalized communities. As a result of historic discriminatory housing policies in the US, such as redlining, low income neighborhoods and communities of color are often geographically sited near industrial areas, toxic waste sites and highways with a marked increased exposure to pollution. These neighborhoods also have fewer trees and more concrete, creating a heat island effect. Consequently, these neighborhoods are disproportionately affected by both heat and pollution. In addition, residents in these neighborhoods may lack air conditioning and often pay higher energy bills from insufficient weatherization of their homes. On top of experiencing greater health effects as a result of these environmental exposures, low-income individuals and communities of color often have less access to quality health care and higher rates of comorbidities, such as obesity, diabetes, hypertension, and renal disease when compared to whites. Because the most vulnerable are the ones who experience the effects of climate change first, it's really essential to underscore the impact of the climate gap in minoritized and under-resourced communities. As this diagram illustrates, the pressures applied by climate change amplify multidimensional disparities, enhance vulnerabilities, and accentuate climate impacts, thus perpetuating a vicious cycle of inequity. The effects of colonialism drive similar disparities globally because the wealthiest 10% of the world's population is responsible for producing 50% of global greenhouse gas emissions, a massive climate gap also exists between the global north and the global south, with the impact of climate change disproportionately shouldered by low and middle income countries. The Global Climate Risk Index highlights how climate change affects the most economically disadvantaged nations and people due to increased exposure, increased vulnerability, and far fewer economic resources for resiliency and adaptation. 
Importantly, each of these nations listed here produces less than 1% of total greenhouse gas emissions. Also in these economies, there's a disproportionate dependence on sectors that may be most affected by climate change, and that includes things like agriculture, forestry, and fisheries. And these disparities have created a divide between the global north and the global south, where the economic gap between the world's richest and poorest countries is 25% larger today than it would have been without global warming. Importantly, the economic forces imposed by climate change are expected to have critical knock-on impacts on both infectious and non-communicable diseases. Consequently, by 2030, the World Bank estimates tens of millions of people will be pushed into poverty due to climate change, with poverty serving as one of the strongest determinants of climate vulnerability and a major cause of migration. By 2050, the displacement of 250 million to 1 billion people is predicted as a result of both slow onset climate impacts such as sea level rise, food and water insecurity, drought and ecosystem destruction, as well as by acute climate shocks like extreme weather events. In particular, climate disasters exacerbate existing social vulnerability and political instability and contribute to complex humanitarian crises. Population displacement due to climate change is resulting in a growing rural to urban migration pattern that is increasingly burdening already overcrowded cities with limited resources for food, shelter, and jobs. Mass population migration is also a key issue globally due to the anticipated alteration and amplification of patterns of infectious diseases and expected exacerbation of health disparities. A prime example of this scenario is the, civil, is the Syrian civil war, which ultimately stemmed from rural to urban migration that was triggered by prolonged drought and ill-conceived water use policies. Conflicts enhance disease transmission, case in point with parasites like Leishmania tropica in which humans are the primary reservoir. Recrudescence of old world leash was seen in Syria in association with this conflict. So throughout this talk, I've referred repeatedly to the multifactorial and complex nature of interactions which climate change imposes on human health. So before we move on, I just wanted to highlight all of these factors related to climate change and how they influence disease in complex ways. And I think this diagram helps to at least visualize the magnitude of climate impacts on, on health and disease vulnerability. But just like with disease and social determinants of health, Climate forces also influence health systems in complex and multifactorial ways and subject the health sector to broad pressures from climate change. We are seeing extraordinary damage to infrastructure from billion dollar climate disasters, which are steadily increasing. These events disrupt global supply chains, they devalue real estate and reduce insurability. All of this threatens institutional financial security. A recent study showed that 25% of critical infrastructure in the US, including hospitals, fire and police stations, power plants, and water treatment facilities are at risk of failing from floods. Moreover, 700 hospitals along the Atlantic and Gulf Coast are at risk of hurricane-related impacts. We also have an aging electric grid with increasing weather-related power outages in the US. These photos of flooding from Tennessee, where I live, show the massive damage to infrastructure and the disruption of emergency services that occur. And yes, that is a fire truck underwater. Also during extreme weather events, patients often have no means of transportation or communication to seek care, no power or clean water, and their medications may be destroyed. So the confluence of these factors combine to totally up and access to and delivery of medical care. Clinics, nursing homes, and hospitals across the nation have been severely damaged or destroyed by extreme weather events, deeply affecting the ability to provide care to the community. 
So with the fragility of critical infrastructure in our country and a lack of healthcare resiliency in this post-COVID era and increasing financial hardships and economic pressures caused by climate change, health, health systems will be increasingly threatened in the future. So this talk should have hit home the point that climate change is causing a global health crisis. According to the IPCC, to mitigate the worst impacts of climate change on human health, we have to drastically reduce greenhouse gas emissions to limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And we're not on track to do that. But that means we're at a crucial crossroads where every tenth of a degree matters for both planetary and human health. So our current and future action will be enormously consequential, leading many to consider climate change to be the existential crisis of this century. So how can dermatologists change this trajectory? It's noteworthy that a couple of recent surveys have shown that the majority of dermatologists are concerned about climate change. And while we have good reason to be concerned, we also have much opportunity for action and advocacy, and this gives me a tremendous amount of hope. So I wanna end on a positive note uh, to here today and inspire you to, to take action. I think our primary duty is to our patients and climate change is a critical determinant of health. So I would encourage you to take an environmental history and consider how climate change may impact your patients individually. Advise them to check indices for heat, air quality, and UV prior to outdoor activities. Numerous apps and websites exist for this. Be sure you educate your patients about disruption of thermoregulation when you prescribe medications such as antihistamines or uh, anticholinergics in general. Be sure your patients know to stay well hydrated and that they can recognize the signs of heat stress. And if extreme weather is imminent, engage in targeted risk communication with your patients, especially those who are most vulnerable, to be certain that they have the needed resources, a plan, and a go bag with their supplies and health records and medications. Encourage patients to wear hats, cover their skin with long-sleeved UPF shirts and pants, which not only protects from UV and heat, but it also blocks some pollution exposure as well. I think it's interesting that while we're responsible for treating the health harms from climate change, quite ironically, the healthcare sector is also a major contributor. The healthcare industry in general is, a, is among the most carbon intensive service sectors in the industrialized world, contributing 5% of global greenhouse gases. And here in the US, the healthcare sector contributes to 10% of, of national greenhouse gas emissions. Globally, the US healthcare system is particularly um, egregious and we really should be rather ashamed because we're responsible for a quarter of the global healthcare greenhouse gas emissions more than any other nation. So we have to limit the negative env environmental consequences of our care delivery. So for tangible action um, that, that you can do as an individual, dermatologists can modify practice by considering the six Rs, rethink, reduce, refuse, reuse, repair, and recycle. So for example, only open what you need for a procedure, segregate waste properly, reprocess single use items when appropriate, recycle, and rethink approaches to infection control and prescribing. And services such as My Green Doctor, which is a free membership benefit of the American Academy of Dermatology, provides an amazing step-by-step -step guide to get you started within your practice. Also, the British Association of Dermatology has this amazing sustainability toolkit. Um, it's, it's so helpful and beautiful, and you can download that online, and it is incredibly helpful as well. Another solution is to reduce patient travel by relying more on virtual platforms to deliver care. One benefit I think to emerge from the pandemic is the proof of concept that leveraging teledermatology has the potential to not only increase access to care and lower costs for patients, but to also substantially lower carbon emissions as these studies have shown. 
Other meaningful steps include reducing our own professional travel. For example, offering virtual residency interviews re reduces carbon in an equivalent amount to the annual output of more than 11,000 cars. Travel to meetings is another huge source. And I think the pandemic also proved that we can meaningfully learn, network and collaborate virtually. So attend more virtual meetings. More importantly, this the means of knowledge exchange greatly reduces carbon footprint when we can do this virtually like we are today. And when you do have to travel to meetings, consider using carbon offsets to minimize the impacts of your travel. However, despite all of that, about 80% of healthcare emissions result actually from the supply chain and manufacturing with carbon emissions of pharmaceuticals consistently calculated to be among the top contributor to healthcare's carbon footprint, accounting for about 25% of all CO2 emissions uh, within the National Health Service in the UK. So I think there's an opportunity here for meaningful engagement and innovation in sustainable skincare and pharmaceutical manufacturing. And that should be paramount and something that we are championing as well as dermatologists. And if you're interested in learning more or getting involved, I would say please join the American Academy of Dermatology's expert resource group on climate change and environmental issues. If you're interested, you can email me and I'll add you to the list. The International Society of Dermatology also has a committee on climate change, and the American Academy of Dermatology is a member of the Medical Society Consortium on Climate and Health, and they offer a number of educational events and, and webinars to learn more about climate impacts, as well as many opportunities to engage in advocacy, including at the legislative level. There are multiple educational opportunities. For example, you can attend the Scientific Forum on Climate Change and our annual ERG meeting each year at the AAD. Also this year at the Innovation Academy, we're going to have a brand new session on sustainability and implementation in your practice. Also check out the January 2021 issue of the International Journal of Women's Dermatology, which was entirely dedicated to climate change. Also, the Expert Resource Group publishes a newsletter called Climate Quarterly, which has literature and policy updates, sustainability tips, and reviews on climate-sensitive disease. And you can find back issues on the ERG website, which is climatedermatology.com. Sorry, that is misspelled on the slide. So there should be an E after the T uh, to spell climate dermatology. In addition, you know, for anyone tuning in internationally, many dermatology societies are incorporating climate change and sustainability into their professional societies. And so, for example, the British Association of Dermatology and the European Academy of Venereology and Dermatology has robust efforts as well. Um, so I encourage you all, if you're not a member of the AAD and are international, to look at your own dermatology societies. And if they're not engaging in this, by all means, please step forward. And I'm happy to help you if, if there's an initiative that someone wants to start. And so I just want to finish by um, summarizing what I think are our future priorities. So we have to recognize that the magnitude and complexity of global climate change affects every human in every nation. It crosses multiple scales, disciplines, systems, and societal levels. Therefore, mitigation and adaptation require a multidisciplinary approach. So dermatology cannot operate in a silo. We must engage stakeholders like pharma and collaborate with other sectors to develop innovative cross-cutting solutions. We can and should pressure our health systems and our medical societies to decarbonize. Funding a climate and health research agenda must also be prioritized to fill knowledge gaps and identify the barriers and opportunities for climate solutions. We must champion education, and we also need buy-in from the private sector with full integration of environmental, social, and governance factors. The paradigm has really shifted, and we have entered a new era of climate medicine where we will face expansive climate-driven in increases in disease burden and medical demand. 
Notably, the effects of climate change are interwoven and the critical pressures applied by climate change act as force multipliers, increasingly magnifying the impact on health, social determinants, and health systems. To achieve a viable future, I want to end by positing that we have a moral imperative to decarbonize our delivery of dermatologic care and to prioritize climate and health in our research, advocacy, and policies. And we must support resiliency and social justice in our vulnerable and marginalized populations. So thank you so much for your time. My email is listed here. Please don't hesitate to reach out. I'd be delighted to engage with you. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Parker. That was a fantastic talk. Um, we've already been getting people, like I was having people texting me during your talk saying this is fantastic and very timely. So thank you so much. Um, we have a few um, audience questions. Yes, so please. Again, uh, Emmanuel asks, could you share any observances regarding potential increased prevalence of mosquito-borne diseases in sub-Saharan Africa, particularly in regions where these diseases are already endemic? Additionally, what strategies or interventions are accessible for individuals uh, facing resource constraints in these areas? Yeah, that's a that's a great question, and you know it's interesting, and and it's um, it's perhaps the tide is changing a little, but much of where climate impacts are felt disproportionately, such as sub-Saharan Africa, that is probably the place where there's the least amount of research that has been done historically and currently, but we are starting to see more happen. Interestingly, mosquitoes um, don't like it if it's too hot. So we may see a shift northward in these diseases where currently, uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, if it continues to heat up, we may see fewer mosquitoes there and more uh, spread into north latitudes or southern latitudes that are cooler. In addition, mosquitoes are not prevalent at elevation, but again, as we begin to heat up, we may see increasing mosquito-borne diseases uh, in mountainous areas such as the Andes where perhaps mosquitoes are not typically prevalent because of the cooler temperatures. So it, it remains to be seen. There's some modeling studies that have been done looking at this, um, but it's it's a little bit unclear. Um, this is not an, uh, you asked about individual efforts and it's not an individual effort, but I have to um, just uh, mention this. And if you've not heard of Wolbachia, to look it up because um, uh, in a number of countries in Africa, they are infecting their mosquitoes with Wolbachia, um, which is basically um, shutting down mosquito transmission of disease, which is a really um, a, a cool um, intervention. So um, that's something that's super interesting. And there's some really cool videos out there on YouTube that explain how Wolbachia works. So I would encourage you all to go and, and look at that. Um, in terms of just individual effort, and I think this is um, no matter where you live, um, you know, uh, uh, protecting yourself from insect bites is really important. Deep-based insect repellents remain the most effective. You don't need like 100% deep, probably around 20% is um, good enough. Um, but that remains one of the most effective ways to prevent mosquito bites as well as protective clothing. Of course, things like Aedes or day biters, so mosquito nets don't protect against dengue and Zika and chikungunya, malaria, um, uh, uh, Anopheles is a night biter, so um, bed netting does protect against malaria transmission. But if you live in an area where malaria is endemic, um, consider using bed netting. Screens on windows are helpful. Um, home improvements can be really helpful in mosquito uh, prone areas and where vector borne diseases are common, including even for things like reduvid bugs and Chagas transmission. Um, so uh, insects like to enter through cracks and tears in screens. And, and so repairing that can be a very effective strategy as well. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, we have another question. This is from Dr. David Perez Meza. Uh, he says, excellent presentation. Congrats to Dr. Rawlings. Uh, in the past 20 plus years, I've seen more and more hair loss in children and young adults. Um, and he's curious your opinion if climate change is like a big factor um, in alopecia and peds populations. 
Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, it's a great question. I think um, to be determined, I, I think we don't really know. There's some suggestion that perhaps air pollution exposure may be affecting hair growth and may be triggering certain forms of alopecia, including alopecia areata. But again, it's not been well studied and there's not a lot of data. So it's hard to say if there is truly an association. Certainly we can see things like alopecia areata flare after extreme weather events simply due to uh, the stress of those events. Um, interestingly too, I think there may, you know, potentially in certain parts of the world, there could be a nutritional component. So one thing I didn't talk much about in today's lecture is food and water insecurity, but um, we're seeing not only extreme weather events like drought destroying crops, but even massive flooding will destroy crops. And as CO2 levels increase in the atmosphere, it increases plant biomass. But what that does is effectively decrease nutritional content for critical things like B vitamins and protein and iron and zinc. And so we may be seeing in the future more um, anemia and other things that could play into hair loss. And in general, climate change tends to increase transmission of infectious diseases. Um, while COVID is, while there's some aspects of COVID that maybe were worsened by climate change, um, it, it wasn't specifically a, a, a climate sensitive disease. However, that being said, you know, viral infections that cause acute illness can precipitate things like telogen effluvium. So any viral illness, um, including mosquito-borne diseases that cause high fevers may also trigger telogen effluvium. So I suspect that hair loss as a broad category has a number of climate sensitive avenues that may trigger or exacerbate it, but it's not been well defined and well understood um, as of now. But if you wanna study it, give me a call. <laughs> we, can, we can dig into that. We need yeah. more research. So <laughs> yeah, that would be awesome. Um, yeah. And actually just kind of anecdotally, like in some of our, um, you know, connected tissue disease data sets, we see like SIP enzyme dysregulation, which is like, you know, xenobiotic metabolism, yeah. which I'm sure is impacted by pollution. So um, yeah, that would be fantastic. And I have um, one last question. Um, yeah. if I can sneak it in before the top of the hour. Um, so how could you, um, uh, advise our audience, like if they want to get involved in advocacy or things like that, like, are there any like, um, Capitol Hill days or like, you know, maybe things on an international scale, um, just to kind of, you know, help, you know, we have a lot of trainees and they want to, they want to do something positive. So, yeah. Yeah. So a number of states have groups that are called something like clinicians for climate change. Um, and so I would check out your local state uh, medical groups that are dedicated to climate advocacy, because there's a lot of impact you can make actually on a local level. And just like one example, the group in North Carolina, the Clinicians for Climate Change group in North Carolina, actually got all school buses turned into EVs. Um, and, and so they actually did a study showing that diesel fuel impacts asthma rates in children who ride school buses and have to breathe the fumes. And because they showed harm to children, they were able to get laws passed and transition all of the school buses in the state to electric and no longer emission producing um, uh, uh, fossil fuel burning uh, vehicles. So that's just one example of how lo local advocacy can be incredibly impactful. And then the American Academy of Dermatology is a member of the Medical Society Consortium for Climate and Health. You can, you can join the Medical Society Consortium. You can sign up for their newsletter. They have an annual meeting. And as at the end of that meeting is a Capitol Hill Day uh, in Washington, DC. And I've done that a number of times and it's, it's really interesting and quite a lot of fun. And you'll get advocacy training. Um, and um, walk you through the talking points. And there's generally people that will accompany you who've done it uh, many times and are very experienced. Um, so those are two avenues for sort of legislative advocacy, policy advocacy. I would also encourage you just to take ideas to your medical association, your, you know, in your state, 
um, which would be a, an arm of the AMA, and perhaps bring a resolution to your House of Delegates for your medical association meetings, and see if you can push that through and actually leverage the lobbying arm of your state medical society to push for policy changes around climate impacts. And I think that matters most when it's an impact that directly impacts the population in your state. So for example, there's been some successful advocacy through medical societies on um, oil pipelines and, and other things that were directly harming um, communities and in particular uh, indigenous populations and marginalized communities. So those are a few examples nationally or internationally. Um, I check out what EADV and British Association of Dermatology are doing. I think they have a number of advocacy issues, but I can't, uh, and opportunities to engage, but I don't, I don't really know much about the legislative aspects in other countries and how that, how that process works. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Thank you so much for all of that advice. Um, and it's a little past the hour, so we don't want to keep everybody, but uh, thank you so much, Dr. Parker, for giving that um, really insightful and educational presentation. Thanks to everybody who joined us and happy Earth Day, everybody. Take care. Happy Earth Day. Thank you.